Good afternoon, or, or good morning, to you West Coasters, and welcome to Food Processing's webinar, Eight Formula Management Features for Food Manufacturers. I'm Dave Fusaro, editor of Food Processing Magazine, and uh, for starters, well, if, if you're hearing me, you apparently have no problem with the sound, but if you are having any problems hearing or viewing today's webcast, uh, make sure you, uh, you can type a question in that question and answer box, which should be the just under the main slide window, and one of our IT people will get back to you quickly. That ask a question box is also where you send a question that we will answer at the end of today's webcast. But at any time during the webcast, you can enter your question there. And just under that is related content, handouts, where you can find some material from our sponsor of today's webcast, Vicinity Software including some case studies involving two real food processors. As I said, our webinar today is sponsored by Vicinity Software. In a minute, you'll hear from this guy, Randy Smith, who he's the CEO and the founder who drew upon his family background and years as a consultant to create a software focused on small to mid-sized manufacturers in the batch and process industries. Their product, Vicinity Food, is a comprehensive, scalable ERP and MRP software system designed for food and beverage processors and other process manufacturers. Randy says most manufacturing software is built for discrete manufacturing. So even with customizations and add-on tools, those packages are not the best fit for process and batch. Food manufacturers are expected to streamline operations, reduce costs, drive supply chain efficiencies, adapt to regulatory environment requirements, increase customer satisfaction, I'm getting out of breath, and more. So how can these manufacturers navigate the challenges without losing productivity? Well, by using software made specifically for food and beverage processing. So to explain those eight batch processing software features you absolutely must have, specific to the food and beverage world, here is Randy Smith. Great. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having us. And the, um, what I want to do is to take a few moments to talk a little bit about uh, some of the insights that we're having of some key software features that we're finding to be important for food manufacturers over the past few years and then also out into the future. Um, specifically, um, I want to talk a little bit um, about first off a little bit about how we fit into into this conversation and then we'll get into some actual um, uh, actual key items that we see um, so vicinity has been around for a number of years uh, it's about 2001 uh, we released the product and i've uh, been continuously uh, improving uh, picking up a new feature functionality as the as the world in, in food manufacturing changes uh, and generally think of us as a full ERP suite from financials to distribution to manufacturing, scheduling, compliance, all of that. Basically, all those uh, those functions that you would uh, typically incur as a food manufacturer. Um, so today, what I'd like to do is is have pulled together a list of uh, you know, eight different features that I think are helpful uh, to be looking for, or if you're on a software application, kind of pushing to either implement or uh, get implemented into your your environment. Uh, in this case, kind of categorizing in a couple of main areas, uh, you know, lots and, and expiration dates and things like that are kind of a big topics in the food space. Um, we'll talk a little bit also about quality in the quarantine and then get into some more operational type uh, items, you know, around the batch ticket and things like that. And then, of course, uh, nutritional information so that we all are in compliance with the uh, nutrition label. The uh, first, first off, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, lot trace. Um, first off, I think there are really kind of two main reasons for lot trace. One is is the obvious uh, for a mock or an audit recall or a, or a live recall. Um, that's probably pretty straightforward. That uh, you know, a auditor says, "Here's lot uh, ABC of this raw material. Uh, where did you use it? Who did it go to?" Um, 
And uh, that's one piece of it. And I think that's a pretty obvious one. The other part of it may not be so obvious. And that is that lot trace being able to go from a raw material into an intermediate, into a finished good, out to a customer, that concept is also becomes the skeleton or the backbone for being able to tie other data together, like quality data as an example, being able to take quality data from raw material and see how it might have impacted the finished good or how customer satisfaction um, changed. So being able to tie all that data back together through the lot trace would give you uh, information as it relates to quality information, but also costing information and even scheduling and machine efficiencies. So while at one hand, most of us are doing lot trace, um, whether it be manually or electronic, we're doing it largely for compliance reasons. I think there's actually um, a more compelling reason, and that is to help you make some operational changes as well. Now, one thing to know about adding lot trace electronically is it does add the workload as it relates to recording uh, the lot information. So for example, it's got to start at the ingredient receipt. And so on your, your purchase order receiving process, getting that lot in and being able to record it in an efficient manner, that is actually probably the most time consuming in my opinion, uh, and labeling it and making sure that that label is on that ingredient and then moving it into production. Another insight that we've seen is there's a debate out there as to what lot number should be used uh, on the physical inventory that comes in. Uh, do we use the manufacturer's lot number? Do we use our own lot number? I personally am a big fan of using uh, your own lot number. Uh, say by item, you have a lot number in sequence associated with it. Uh, the main reason for that is, is that everybody's every vendor is gonna have a different lot number in sequence. The, if you own that, your employees then start recognizing what is the lot number and what's just ancillary information that was on the vendor uh, label or in the vendor uh, packaging. So it really simplifies communication if you own that lot number itself. Um, so once you have it on hand, typically label it with your lot number and then gets moved into a batch. Uh, that typically, uh, whether you use a barcode data collection or just jotting the lot number down is a, is a good use. I've actually seen um, some clients, when they print a label, they've got a couple of, of, of copies of that label, peel and stick labels. And so they'll take that label and, and put it on the manual printed batch ticket if they're a manual kind of process. That helps save a little bit. Yes, they burn some labels, but if you design the label sheet properly, uh, it's not it's not that bad. Uh, so just an easy way to get the actual physical validation of what that lot was that was used onto something for data entry or data collection later. Um, so you go through the batch, record all the lots against the batch and put the finished good on hand. Uh, this is another area of, of interesting discussion is what lot number do you use on a produced item? Uh, some people use a function of Julian date. Other people use the uh, the line that you're running on or a product category or things like that. So being able to have your method of lot assignment uh, be native to the software is really important. Uh, so it helps with that ability for uh, users to be able to look at a lot number and make some in intelligent decisions based on that lot as they move forward. Um, and also, uh, you know, put the finished good on hand and then you ship it out. That's pretty obvious. The one that a lot of people forget about is inventory adjustments and cycle counts. So just be aware that as you get to a cycle count, when you're lot tracking, your your count actually has to be a bit more accurate. Otherwise, you're going to start um, without lot traceability. If you undercount one month and pick it up the next month, yeah, it's not great, but it's 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 with lots, it gets a lot more complicated to kind of say, oh, wait a second, it was really there the previous month uh, in the inventory after you've written it off in your cycle count. So be really careful as it relates to those cycle counts. Otherwise, you'll create what might not have been a problem in the system for a problem in the system. So really spend time on that cycle count uh, capability and, and functionality that you have in your application. Kind of moving on, but on the same category would be around lot expiration and expiration dates. Um, kind of some reasons to be looking at this and, and spending some brain cycles on figuring out and getting it right is to, first off, the obvious one is to reduce loss, reduce um, obsolescence. Um, and um, so you're not letting a lot... Uh, 
expire before it gets used or before it's within the window that you can use it. But the other one may not be as noticeable to some some companies, and that is uh, the, the effectiveness and freshness of the product itself. It will eventually start affecting the quality of the product. And so while we most people are focused on, I don't want to throw this inventory away, there's also a part of it that has to do with quality and has to do with customer service and, and making your product the, the best that it could be. Your formula was geared toward a lot of this specific um, uh, freshness, uh, effectiveness, that type of thing. Uh, so in doing this, you're going to want to be able to uh, the, the assign the lot and the expiration date at the time of receipt. This is, of course, for an inbound ingredient. Uh, that's going to be dependent upon your vendor. Uh, so this is not something that you're just going to be able to calculate. Um, so it depends on when it was made, how long it was on their shelves, Etc. So, get ready for a, 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 an operation where you are recording not the receipt date, but rather the manufacturer date, or better than that, the expiration date of that particular product. Um, as you are um, using product, uh, one of the things we do in our application is a concept called directed picking. Uh, there are some companies that will decide which lots they want to go out into the out into production first, um, mostly around a FIFO basis, first expire, first out, uh, so that uh, we get good uh, lot rotation in that. In in our software application, we're able to actually present here here are the quantities that you need to use, and here are the, ordered by the FIFO basis, so you can go and and pick those first. On more manual processes, like you print a batch ticket and now you're static, uh, the other thing that we will do is actually print that group of lots, not just the quantity that's necessary, but a little more, uh, so that they have lots to pick from in the order of the expiration date. So you don't necessarily need a computer out on the floor to make this happen, but you are gonna have to rethink or think through how you print that batch ticket and how you get those lots on there to help your um, help your warehouse identify which lots need to go in first. And this is really mostly around uh, communication. It's mostly around identification and communication. Let's identify the lots before they expire, before they get outside of a window. And then let's also communicate to the warehouse that we need to move these, these first. We need to get these to the front of the line uh, to go ahead and process those through. So lot expiration dates and lot trace itself are, are a couple of big uh, features that have got a lot of tentacles throughout the application, uh, whether it be quality or, or um, scheduling or costing, etc. Kind of moving along, and, and, and next one kind of get into a series of some quality uh, conversations, and that is um, basic quality tracking and quarantine. There are really kind of a couple of different reasons that I see for this. The obvious one is to isolate non-conforming raw material or ingredients. If it comes in and it doesn't meet your specs, if there was something done in transportation, um, you know, the refrigerator truck, uh, when it pulled up, the ambient temperature in the truck was was out of spec, those kind of things. Basically identifying those raw materials and segre segregating them and so that we, until we can further investigate what's going on, uh, see if we need to send them back, destroy them, or they can be used to maybe some other process. But that's the obvious one. The not so obvious one though is about vendor performance. So being able to go and harvest that data, so to speak, be able to come back and find how their conformance to the specification, the specification they gave to us and we worked with them, we need product that is X, uh, it, how often are they hitting that? Or more importantly, how often are they not? Uh, and so being able to to have that information available in a database to be able to pull from uh, is, is really helpful. In, in, in our world, there are three primary uh, QC tests that you probably ought to be looking for. One is, is obvious inbound raw materials. So think in terms of a lot of raw material and be able to prescribe different QC tests and specifications for each of those ingredients. So I've got uh, eggs going into, into my formula. Uh, what tests or observations or what certificates am I looking at in, in, uh, for that particular lot to, to make sure that it is of the quality that is necessary. So that one on the inbound raw material lot. 
Uh, and then on passing of that, whether it be formal with a test or otherwise, uh, you know, uh, reading a, a, a certificate, being able to pass that lot so that it can be used in production. So in our system, you can set up the system to have a lot uh, on hand, but it hasn't passed QC. And so we can gate that and say can't, that lot can't be used in production until it passes QC. The second area of quality for us, at least, and I think for most systems, is going to be around in-process batch tests. The whole idea here is we draw a sample from some stage in the process, whether it be just a quick visual test by the line or maybe it's more formal and it goes into the lab and, and actual bench tests are done. The, uh, those tests are defined at the formula level and our samples are drawn from the individual batch while the batch is being processed. Again, there's a release process associated with this. If there's any corrective action that's necessary, be able to record that corrective action, what was done, um, maybe even what lot they need to pull from because there might be a lot attribute, um, a, a, a strength of a particular lot that will bring this back into spec for us, uh, things like that. So being able to communicate out to production, this is what happened and this is what I need you to do to fix it, um, is all part of that in-process batch. And then being able to release that batch for further process. The further process would typically either be packaging or further process might be it. It might be an intermediate, like a topping or something like that that's going into a further process. But being able to release that lot so it can go into production and continue its process. And then finally, um, you know, finish good test, packaged uh, product tests. Those are going to get around uh, shelf life stability, and you might have a microbial test or something like that that might take a while to run. Uh, being able to record that information against the end item, the end item lot is really important. Also being able to record QC tests after the batch is completed. So you might have shelf life stability as an example. You might have uh, something sitting on the shelf for a while. Uh, you've released the batch, but you're, you're monitoring this to make sure that everything looks okay. Um, it, is, um, it is an assumption that it's going to pass. Uh, so be able to have that ability to be able to, in some scenarios, be able to ship a product before it passes QC or more importantly, before you close down QC so you can continue to enter QC results against that, uh, that end item. We also find helpful to be able to have uh, multiple panels of tests. So you might have a sample out there that you have to take multiple samples from a larger batch and then test them independently, but aggregate them together for the batch. We get into this in, in uh, like nut processing example. They'll take a number of different samples from different uh, times in the run or, 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 or feedstock that they've got. They'll take that and do individual tests, but aggregate the results accordingly. Uh, but then also the ability to be able to record multiple tests um, of the same test that you might do three or four times. It's not just a different sample, but it's the same sample and I run the test multiple times. The ability to be able to document that data and put it somewhere without causing a lot of stress and strain on your, on your, on your staff uh, is, is helpful. And then finally, quarantine. when we get down to quarantine, the, uh, historically, most people have quarantined by site. I think that draws back from the day, from the, the very physical quarantining of everything on this side of the warehouse is not good. Everything on this side of the warehouse is good to ship, and we only pull from this warehouse. That's quarantining by site, which is perfectly fine. Uh, you see other companies that go more to an individual lot quarantine uh, so that uh, you can actually commingle and have them staged in the same area, but there's some identifier in the system's perspective that lot has been passed or that part of that lot has been passed or part of that lot has been quarantined. Uh, on a physical side, that might be a sticker like, it gets a green sticker when it passes and you look for a green sticker and we don't send anything out the door unless it has a green sticker. That is kind of the, the manual equivalent of what we're doing from a data perspective. The good part about having it in data, if you're able to do that, is now we can query it. Now we can see uh, what batch has created that and then be able to analyze that and what quality information might have lead us to making some operational or process changes. So. 
while the manual process is absolutely functional, um, great ideas, uh, the, putting it in a system will allow you to be able to uh, work with that data and do some more analysis later. Um, Many food companies actually have some allergens, whether it be ingested or topical, et cetera, uh, that they have to deal with. Um, m most, most people are, think about that as it relates to uh, compliance reporting. Uh, disclosure of these allergens are, are present in this formula. Uh, you also have got um, the, re the addressing the issue of cross-contamination of being able to make sure that one allergen doesn't go into something that wasn't marked for an, as an allergen. So being able to identify what the allergens are on an item can help notify people about uh, what should be where and what shouldn't be uh, in a particular formula. There's also another reason to get a system handling allergens, and that is it, it assists in scheduling. Um, and once I said it, you probably thought, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense because now I can have all of uh, these allergens run together and then I do a, a clean op and then I, I go into another allergen as an example. So it helps the scheduling side of things. So one of the things you'll want to do, one of the things we do in our system is, is mark uh, each individual ingredient or component with a known allergen. Uh, it can actually have multiple, as you could just imagine. Um, and then when you use that ingredient in a batch ticket, we will typically, on a printed batch ticket, it will disclose that allergen. Uh, and on some allergens, I'll actually make a disclosure on the batch ticket that this contains you know, dairy, nuts, et cetera, uh, so that it's all known and, and people know. Uh, it's a last check to make sure that people understand that behind this may be a, a, a cleanup. Um, and we're on this particular allergen. Uh, so it just gives good communication out to the floor. And then finally, on the scheduling side, being able to visualize the schedule by allergen will be really helpful. Uh, it's something that we do. We color code our, our, our schedule for that so that we can easily see these are nut allergens, these are dairy allergens, these are mixed, these are whatever, so that we can, the scheduler can start planning uh, for any kind of changeover that is scheduled. The, um, the next area to, to talk about is around... Um, uh, substitutions, and we're kind of into operations at this point. Um, there are times in which we need to do a substitution. Uh, there may be a low inventory. I'm out of this particular ingredient, but I can use that particular ingredient with a with a, a particular uh, factor or um, or strength potency. Uh, so being able to do that substitution to address a low inventory uh, issue is there. We also want to kind of a similar note would be around lot expiration. Uh, if you've got scenarios where you're coming up on a, a lot expiration of one product, but you're perfectly fine on another, or or you know that you're you're going to be you're going to be expiring of this lot and I can use it as a substitute somewhere else to move that inventory. Being able to have that, that those substitutions, what is able to be substituted, uh, will really help in how can we work off this lot? What else can is being used in it that is a, an ample substitution? Um, it, and uh, then finally, we also potentially have some customer uh, requirements where we've got a number of clients that may be uh, tolling uh, for, for somebody uh, and they need to require, you need to use a particular ingredient, particular raw material in that process. Uh, so being able to know which are those substitutions that are available is helpful. And in our system, we actually go to the... Um, we have item substitutions, so this item can be substituted for that item, but we also have got um, uh, just uh, formula-specific substitutions. So I might normally be able to substitute this raw material for that raw material, but in some cases, I can only do it for these formulas. Uh, so it gives you a bit more granularity to make sure that people are all working from the same from the same page. Um, we, um, we embraced the the uh, strength and the sizing um, a number of years ago uh, because we were finding that it 
it made a lot more sense for the user just to be able to predefine that and let the system go ahead and do the math for them automatically. Uh, as we get into batches, um, units of measure are a big deal for formula manufacturers. We um, uh, being able to go from weight to volume or, or um, you know, um, bags to, to pounds, etc. The whole idea behind this is to be able to communicate out to the floor in a unit of measure that makes sense for that user. So being able to have one item in pounds and another item in gallons now allows you just to dial in uh, exactly how, what's the easiest way for these users to add the product. Um, also, it makes the ability to size a batch to get by an ingredient a lot easier. And, and why you would do that is if you've got a limiting ingredient. I've only got 50, 50 gallons of this particular liquid. How big a batch can I make? Well, if I'm stuck in pounds and I'm not able to go in different units of measure, it makes it much more difficult to scale that batch to get in those type of, of scenarios. In general, we find that weight is probably the best way to go with units of measure. In other words, the base underlying. That's not possible for everybody. We would work with a lot of breweries, for example, and, and weight would drive them crazy. Uh, so in some cases, it's volume. But as you're probably well aware, time and uh, temperature and, and pressure can affect that, uh, as well as if you're working with a, um, um, a, a mixture or a suspension. Uh, where you've got solids in a liquid um, form suspended that becomes a, a real challenge. So getting back to weight can be really helpful in those type of scenarios. Um, the, the, and then finally, kind of decimal precision is kind of a big deal in this area because remember we were talking about the unit of measure is there to be helpful. Uh, well, let's set the decimal precision down to the unit of measure. So you don't need two or three decimals if you're in in micrograms, um, but you may need it if you're in kilos. Uh, so the whole idea is as you change units of measure, getting decimal precision becomes really helpful. It makes the operators uh, uh, find that to be a lot easier for them to work with uh, when the units of measure are kind of what they're expecting. Um, one of the things that vicinity does is we handle the shop floor schedule and the production schedule and things like that and one of the first things we did uh, was kind of looked at how are customers scheduling and, and why are they scheduling the way they are and one of the areas that we found was just to try to get economies of scale larger runs uh, more batches that type of thing or larger batches uh, and and by scheduling by formula uh, allows multiple end items to be made at the same time. This sounds kind of obvious, but there's not a lot of manufacturing software act that actually does it this way. They schedule at the SKU level. So this can, this jar, this bottle, uh, we're looking at that and you're having to figure out what is the compounding formula that ties all those together. But being able to tie all those together and have a longer run with less changeovers um, helps certainly in scheduling. It most likely helps in costing because down uh, less downtime. And it can also help in quality, especially if you're making a larger mix of a product that's gonna service multiple end items, um, I'm able to test that batch once as opposed to every time I go to make it. So while it may sound subtle and, 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 and not, not so exotic, uh, scheduling by formula is a big differentiator that we have in the market. And then I think that formula manufacturers have exist and then they experience. Um, and so largely by doing this by formula, now we're also able to look at things like allergens and be able to look at what are the common allergens so that I can limit my downtimes and I can, um, I, ca I can get a more efficient production schedule without bouncing all over the place between different types of products and having changeovers um, uh, all over the place. The other thing that we're able to do here is it assists with um, the creation of intermediates. So you may choose to say, if I'm looking at these end items that share this same formula, 
And then I have the ability to make a little bit more, but I'll hold it for a short period of time until I figure out what packaging I need to do. Now I'm able to make a larger run, get my finished goods out that I need, but also have some stock there to do a quick packaging run, maybe for a customer label or um, maybe a different package size, that type of thing. So it really kind of gives us a lot of flexibility when you start thinking in terms of the schedule, starting at the formula level, not at the end item level. And then you also get into scenarios here where you might have uh, multiple facilities that are that are um, in play here. So being able to formulate at the formula level or, or produce at the formula level and then look at it at the facility within that. So I know that I've got all of this that I need to make, but this facility can handle this product and this facility can handle that product. It really helps me balance my work uh, if I can make them at either place, but it also allows me to earmark uh, products, formulas that can be made at very specific uh, environments because the other facility may take the intermediate from the previous facility and package it for them. So looking at it at the formula, scheduling at the formula level really kind of opens up a lot of opportunities uh, around scheduling. And then finally uh, is into nutritional analysis. Um, one of the reasons for um, we, we all we all handle the nutritional analysis, whether we do it internally or somebody else does it. Uh, so we've got the ingredient statement and we've got the nutrition panel. Um, putting it in a system, in an integrated system, allows you to have a single source of truth. So I've got all my raw materials that came from the supplier that's in my inventory with all this allergen information we've been talking about and specs it's information that we've, we've got. But I've also got physical properties associated, nutritional properties associated with those raw materials in that same place. So I don't have it in yet another database or another Excel spreadsheet being able to manage it. So being able to get it to a central, central location gives you a, um, a, a common common source of truth. Everybody's working from the same scenario. But it also now allows me to communicate that out to other people in my organization or be able to communicate it outside the organization. So being able to have that nutritional analysis in the system for R&D allows the R&D department to share with customer service and then eventually with sales on what um, what's going on with this product and, and what is the, the common nutritional information associated with that. So at Vicinity, we, we assign the nutri nutrients at the ingredient level with the supplier and, and we have a panel that allows you to calculate dynamically on the fly uh, the ingredient uh, statement, the ingredient properties associated with that particular formula. Um, and uh, also incorporate the different serving sizes associated with that with that uh, product with that with that formula. Now at Vicinity, one of the things we do is we actually can create a nutrition label, but we actually find there's some really great products out there that do that as well. But they may not handle a master formula, they may not do scheduling well, they may not do quality well, etc. And there's some really good ones out there that aren't that expensive. And so we've got integrations, integration ways to get that master formula that was developed in R and D on our side, push it out to uh, the 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 application that's actually generating that that panel and that label for you for camera ready art, and then can hand back data if necessary back to us. I mean, you may want to send back uh, a PDF of the label back into us, and that's all possible as well. So, not we're not trying to be everything to everybody in that scenario, but enough. I think your software should get enough to to be able to do what you need to do at that moment and then allow other systems to pick that up without you having to rekey, have multiple databases, et cetera. So nutritional analysis is one of those areas that we've had some really great success in partnering with a couple of different uh, label, nutrition uh, calculation label companies. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of what what I wanted to talk about today with the, um, you know, kind of the, the, the primary areas that I'm seeing, you know, kind of around uh, quality and lot traceability, as well as down into operations, making the uh, operators more efficient and the schedule more concise and be able to uh, get larger um, um, batch sizes and larger runs. 
Um, I, I think those are some of the some of the key elements that I think a food manufacturer could really benefit from. So that's it for me, Dave. I'm going to send it back to you for any if there are any questions anybody might have out there. Yes, yeah, and thank you, Randy. Uh, I think we do have time for a few questions. Now, some of you apparently have already discovered that ask a question box, bottom of your screen, but you may still type a question in there and we will attempt to answer it. And uh, Randy, here's a question that's already come through. What have been some of the key technology changes in the food manufacturing industry over the past few years? Mm -hmm. It's pretty wide yeah. ranging, huh? It is. It is that. It's uh, you know, the the food world has really gone through a number of different um, uh, technology innovations and et cetera. And I would say, if I had to pick just one, it would be the platform. In other words, um, being able to have your software and your data in the cloud rather than on your server in a protected <laughs> environment. Uh, it has been a big change. And now cloud computing has been around for a very long time. Uh, but we as manufacturers in general and some food manufacturers uh, tended to lag behind that largely because uh, protection of their formulas and things like that, which I completely respect. Um, but I think if you were to, to, to look at some of the data centers and how they're protecting the environment and the servers, uh, you would find that most likely the data center is more secure than your wide area network uh, that you can probably sit in the right. parking lot and, and get on it. <laughs> so I would probably say if there were any one thing, it would be that. Uh, we've had a lot of like a country of origin disclosure when China was doing their stuff um, and, and being able to track that and report that. Yeah, we've got a lot of those feature type things, but I would say probably by and large, it would be the platform. People are becoming more comfortable with uh, being in the cloud. It's a great question. Yeah, that certainly was a sea change for the business, for all businesses for that mm -hmm. matter. And, uh, no doubt. And it's uh, probably a first step toward Industry 4.0, which yep. uh, not, not too many food processors are ready for yet, but um, they're getting there. Yeah. I get it. I think COVID, COVID kind of helped push a lot of this as well. Yeah. As you had more people that were remote uh, and needed to be able to access their system, not all companies' uh, infrastructure, hardware infrastructure was really built to be able to have outside access in a protected way, like outside your parking lot. Um, then um, it, this really kind of upped that game. And I, I, so I, th I think that's that's become a big deal. One of my favorite answers to this question is um, high pressure pasteurization. Talking strictly about yeah, machinery right. now, but yep, yep. to me, that's just non thermal processing pasteurization of food. Is uh, somebody really clever figured that one out? That's right. Anyway, sorry, Randy, uh, sorry to go on, but another <laughs> question has come in in the meantime. Um, we are living in times of high inflation. Yes, we are. And how can software help food processors in with this challenging issue? Right. Inflation. Right. Can you? I think so. I, it's okay. all about communication. I think I think it's all about communication, and that is having a good relationship with your supplier. Not as much to to not change your prices. I guess that'd be a nice thing, but actually be able to give you a heads up when those are coming, and then once you are told be able to have tools that would help you see what the impact that's going to have. Uh, not all software allows you to um, to, to have, we, we call it proposed costs, but um, the whole idea is my inventory is costing this right now, but in three months it's gonna be X plus. Um, and what will that look like based on my production schedule or based on my historical production, what does that look like that would, um, would make that, um, how, would, how would that impact my bottom line and how would that be, um, how, would, how would that change my cost when this actual contract comes in? So that's probably the starting place. Uh, so we have clients that are doing this right now, as you could imagine, of kind of getting ahead of the curve and making some determinations of how much of this can we absorb, how much of this uh, do we do we can we pass through, and how much uh, room do we have for maybe substitute items. So it's it's the starting place for for all of that. It is indeed. Uh, what what do you think will be the next big thing in mm -hmm. software? 
for food right. manufacturing. Yeah, so I think um, kind of looking in the crystal ball, um, you know, the obvious answer I'm supposed to say is artificial intelligence. I'm not really sure I, I see that one yet, but uh, that's the answer I'm supposed to give. The uh, For me, it gets more basic than that, and that is sharing information across uh, uh, sources of data, whether it be your control system or whether it be um, your um, uh, your barcode data collection, or whether it be a supplier or a customer, being able to get information from their system into your system and hand it back. You know, we've experienced this for a very long time with, uh, like, if you go to look for directions to get from point A to point B, that's a web service behind the scenes that's happening. And so your phone is making a call to a server saying, how do I get there? And it comes back to you. You didn't have to figure out how to do that. You got that information from somewhere else. And so being able to connect those pieces together uh, for manufacturers is really key. It absolutely is happening, but I think we're going to see that happening at a rocket pace as software providers as well as, well, even the software providers and the hardware, as, as all of these softwares start coming together under common uh, frameworks, ways to communicate with each other, I think that's where we're headed next. Okay. Can you talk about the importance of data analytics to mm -hmm. a manufacturer? Does software make it easy? Oh, does the software make it easier to analyze this data? Yeah, there, absolutely. I mean, that's absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely, and uh, and I think you know we talked about the, at the beginning of the session of being able to correlate data together. That's probably the harder part because the actual visualizing the data has become fairly easy. I'll talk about that in just a second. But being able to connect that data from that is relevant to each other. In other words, say raw material QC versus operational data at the line versus um, a lot information and customer feedback. Being able to pull all that together and connect it is where the key is. There are some really great tools that are that are available to to to, to folks to use. I, we're a, a big Microsoft shop, so Power BI is one of those, as well as Excel uh, dashboards. Uh, but there are a, a lot of others. And getting back to your your previous question of connecting data is being able to take. Um, being able to take a platform that you, you're you comfortable using, as a user you're comfortable using, and connect it into the database and having logical connections to the data inside that database, that is key. So being able to get that information to the user in a way that the user can experience it and is able to change over time. Because the way I look at it today might be different than the way I look at it next year. Uh, and so being able to morph that and change that without having to have an entire IT department is really important. But data analytics and being able to pick your metrics that make sense and don't look at everything because you'll get into analysis paralysis pretty quick. Um, but uh, there's some great tools out there to do that. An important, it's a long one, Randy, uh, an important element of a food quality control system is lot tracking and traceability. Since food manufacturers are subject to regulatory requirements to demonstrate a reasonable recall process on a moment's notice, what do manufacturers need to pull this info together for mm -hmm. a recall? Yeah, so I'm going to assume that we're talking about uh, computer-assisted recall. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and so, so be, because you're clearly doing it manually otherwise. Um, and that is a, a centralized database of your inventory system. Most inventory systems can handle a lot um, versus a serial number. Those are very different. Um, so a lot would be X quantity of this particular lot versus X quantity of that lot. Uh, so being able to handle that. So it starts with a good solid inventory system that's able to handle lot traceability. But then the next part comes in ease of use of entering the lot information because the, the order of magnitude of data that you're going to be required to track is more. There's no doubt but you should only touch it once. So when you do the PO receipt and you get the inventory in and you provide the lot number, apply the label, the rest of it is mostly validation of data. It's not keying of data because it's already there. And then the second part of that would be when you produce something, 
get a lot yeah. generation in the system, uh, some kind of number structure that makes sense to you that the system can generate. Uh, and, and that'll feed back to that same inventory. So the core is the inventory. And then the other pieces around it just make it more efficient and make the burden much less, <laughs> certainly less than a recall manually. Uh, so I, I would suggest that in most environments, a, a computer-aided recall is a heck of a lot better than a manual recall. And I don't think you're going to be able to do a manual recall much longer. Not much longer. The, if the right. FDA has its way, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Can you talk about a couple of features or technology requirements manufacturers need to have? Once they grow from a small company to a medium-sized mm. company, mm -hmm. great question. Yeah. Great question. I Growing would say scheduling. Pains. I would say scheduling, um, because yeah. I think as a as a small company, you've got some of the basic. You've got a lot of traceability issues, whether you're small or big. Um, I would say scheduling is probably next, and then after that would probably be looking at analytics of quality and operational data. So being able to look back at what we've done to get better. Um, so, but I think scheduling is the first because that's what's good. You, 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 you're going to have limited capacity, especially when you're going from small to medium size. You're going to have a capacity issue. It's going to happen. And so being able to get the most out of that uh, is, is paramount. So I, I, would, I, put, I put my money, time, attention, resources into getting my scheduling under control. In today's climate, what does a food processor need to do to keep up with inventory changes? Inventory changes, changes, inventory changes. Can you can you get insight uh, onto the question? Inventory changes. That I cannot. Uh, okay. that's, in today's climate, what does a food processor need to do to keep up with inventory changes? Okay. Or a related um, question, and if you'd rather answer this one, how important <laughs> is it for a food manufacturer to know how changes in inventory costs will affect production? Oh yeah, paramount. Yeah, because okay. you know it's really, it really kind of interesting. I, for me, costs of inventory. There, there are two parts of it. We're probably the question is probably coming from the purchase side of it, which is fine. Like, what is the cost of this production of inventory, uh, this this purchase of this inventory, uh, whether it be yes, the actual can. raw material cost, transportation, etc. That's one part of it. I think there's and and that's we, we were talking about proposed costs and getting ahead of the curve on the on the inflation, etc. On that question earlier, uh, but there's another side of this too, which is around yield analysis. Something we don't spend nearly enough time talking about in this industry is how much are we getting out of the same input. Um, so we spend a lot of time really beating up on procurement to get the the lowest cost, highest quality ingredient. But we don't spend a, as, as much time talking about what are our yields looking like and how can we get better yields? Because I would, I would argue that that is going, the savings on your, your, your productivity, on your yields, on your output is going to dwarf the cost savings on the pennies on the dollar that you're going to have on the raw material. So anyway, that's kind of my take on it. Well, this one's kind of tangential too, uh, but I'll put you on the spot and ask it anyway. Um, you can decline it. Why is it important to review vendor performance on a regular basis? Is that even relevant to uh, your software? Yeah, absolutely. I think. Yeah. Um, I think so. Yeah, I think it, it kind of depends. Yes, I think it, we can just stay with yes. Uh, it it is important. Uh, there are a couple of different ways to look at it. Uh, one is about. It's mostly about. Did you do what you say you were going to do? And when you said you were going to do it. At the end of the day, that's what we're talking about. And we all want that from all of our suppliers. Uh, and how you choose to measure that, I think that's where my 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 hesitation was, is in some cases it's price. How consistent or or how, how well do they communicate price? How is their quality fluctuating over time? What's their transportation or distribution system? I used the example of the refrigeration truck coming in uh, warm. Um, those are all different metrics going after the same thing. Are you delivering what you said you were going to deliver on the time you said you were going to deliver it? Okay. Well, although the 
questions are still coming in. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. We will be sending you an email shortly with instructions on how to download the slides from today's webinar. We'll also let you know when this webinar is available for on-demand viewing, probably within 24 hours. And by the way, even if you or coworkers watch this webinar on demand, if you type a question into the Q&A box, we will get it and we'll magically forward it to Randy for our on-demand answering. And the next screen, the next screen will be uh, an exit survey that we hope you will take, but uh, that'll do it for us. This webinar is over and thank you all for tuning in today.